Greetings and welcome to the Department of Tangents podcast, a conversation with documentary filmmaker Guy Fiorita with an audiobook excerpt from The Shape of Water. I'm Nick Zeno, your host. Back in March, I saw this great film at the Salem Film Festival. The festival focuses on documentaries, and the film I saw is Mole Man, directed by Fiorita, who was in attendance. What I thought I was going to see was a quirky portrait of a 66-year-old man in western Pennsylvania who's built this labyrinthine complex in the woods behind his parents' house. And that's where the film begins. We see Ron salvaging things from abandoned houses, picking through things that got left behind and piling wood and sinks and bags of clocks on his tiny motorbike and bringing them back to his giant collection. It's very whimsical and Ron is a wonderful character. But then the movie unfolds to touch on so many things, autism, family dynamics, economic depression in small town America. Towards the end, it even becomes kind of an adventure film as the characters try to find this mansion Ron keeps describing. And if they can locate it, it might actually help save Ron's life. It's an extraordinary film and it's making the festival circuit now. I would urge you to seek it out. Fiorita says he's close to getting a distribution deal for it and I'll alert you to that on the Department of Tangents blog whenever the news breaks. Fiorita and I discussed the film, and along the way I discover he has tried stand-up comedy, which makes some sense, considering his dynamic timing as a filmmaker. Our featured track this week is a chapter from the audiobook of The Shape of Water. Earlier today I interviewed Daniel Krauss, the book's author. You know the name and the story from the Oscar-winning film by Guillermo del Toro. There's an interesting backstory. Del Toro optioned the idea from Krauss, then Del Toro wrote the screenplay and Krauss wrote the book. It's a complicated story and you'll hear more about it next week. This will get you prepared for that interview. But first, here's Guy Fiorita. Let's set the table about Mole Man. I wanted to structure this in sort of a way where we bring people into the story the way you bring people into it uh, in the film. Because I I think it's a a really brilliant structure, uh, the the way you tell the story. Oh, thanks. So when we meet Ron in the beginning, he's a 66-year-old man living in a rural Pennsylvania town. What is the story when we meet him in the film? So Ron lives at home with his mom. He lives in a town called Butler, Pennsylvania. It's about an hour northeast of Pittsburgh. Uh, They live a few miles outside of town, and he actually lives in a structure that he's built. And the structure is composed of 26 different buildings. There are basements and tunnels that go from building to building, and he's been working on it about 50 years. The actual structure itself looks like a cross between an art installation and kind of a, almost a haunted house from the outside. Right. Inside, it's filled with bright, colorful paint. Um, you know, anytime I show any of my artist friends that, that they're immediately drawn to it and they talk about him as, a, as an outsider artist. He has a very unique color palette sensibility and you know has great a great relationship with color and color combinations he's also a collector of all things big and small um anything Mm -hmm. he has i think about ten thousand doors just uh doors to homes right and the the colors are orange and green and uh, very bright bright colors is that's his yeah and then there's another building that isn't uh, represented in the movie, but he has actually has a whole building that's just a maze made with doors. It's pitch black in there though, so it really doesn't tra- translate on camera. <laughs> right. But uh, I've uh, I've been through it. It's kind of it's kind of scary because you are inside a maze and you don't you know it's very hard to find your way out of there. And then he collects anything from signs to tin cans to toys, you know, um, and. Uh, clocks and arranges all these collections throughout his his structure yes and he's also writes down song lyrics yeah on, he loves on the uh music from the 50s and 60s some 70s but really anything 80s and beyond he doesn't want any part of it mm-hmm. doesn't doesn't understand that music the <laughs> 60s were the best decade and that's it as far as rock's concerned so you know uh beatles beach boys rolling stones that's his uh that's his era mm-hmm. that's his music 
you do some overhead shots to to sort of uh, scan over the, the the top of what he's built, and I I got the feeling watching the film that we still we we hadn't seen even a fraction of it, but and and it would be impossible to represent fully on film. Yeah, it is massive. Um, you know, the overhead does kind of cover does cover the entire compound, but it's really tough to represent the scale of what he's done. Um, at the beginning of one of the shots, you, you can you can catch Ron. You can see him in the bottom of the of the screen and see how small he is compared to the rest of the structure. But you know, you're looking at the top of it, and there are points when it goes 25 feet underground. Mm. So, you know, everything you see on top, there's that much below the surface as well. And then when you're inside, it's a it's amazing itself. So. It's not like you can walk into any room and you're seeing this expansive 2,000 square foot room. It's all broken into tiny rooms all over the place. You know, inside it's like a giant fort with a bunch of tiny rooms everywhere. And so, no mortar uh, and no nails, no, right? No nails, no mortar. It's all fit together by basically, well, the, the he uses block walls for his basement structures. And that's done by having everything perfectly level, no gaps. You know, Ron always talks about how mortar is used to fill your mistakes. That's why people <laughs> use mortar between their block walls. It's, if they get off level a little bit, then you need order, mortar to make up that dip in, in one block or to correct where you're going off level. And those walls eventually fail. Well, his walls are perfectly straight, and um, the blocks are stacked right on top of each other. And then he keeps the earth from pushing in by putting weight on top of that. And he'll build, he'll lay uh, his walls, he'll lay two by fours on their, on their wide side and just stack those one on top of the other and then joint, use joinery at the corners to put them together. His house is overbuilt. It weighs an immense amount and all that weight is kind of what holds his basement walls together and holds the whole thing together basically. You know, he's, he's sort of a, a physics genius when it comes to balancing and and this weight holds that weight, and it's all this interconnected puzzle that if you try to unravel it, you know, it's mind-bending, just what he's got going on there. When you start to look at how this is connected to that and that and that and that and that, it's just one thing built on top of another over 50 years. And it's all done by feel. There's that one scene where where you show how level uh, one of the, the walls is. You put a, a level on it, and he he doesn't use a level. He just knows when it's level yeah he he can just see it so he will start his base layer you know he's right near the water table so he has at some point found level with with water going into he'll dig a footing and then water will fill up that footing and then he water always lays level so he found level with water at one base layer and has used that level to continue throughout his house if that makes sense mm-hmm. so you know once you find level in one spot you could just I, I mean you or I would have to use a level to continue that level but uh, he can do it with his eyes you know mm-hmm. that's all he's been doing for his entire life is building things so I guess he got pretty good at it <laughs> so so this is what yeah. we see in the first 10 minutes or so of the film he's this sort of quirky guy who's built this strange thing in the backyard we see uh, and he's done it all by salvaging things from abandoned homes, basically using his bike and, and only bringing in a truck when he has to do things like move an entire house all at once, which he's done. Correct. Yeah. He's, he's brought it back piece by piece. And he'll go with his bike to the same house, you know, as many as 30 times. There's one scene in the film where you see he writes, he always writes the date he was at the home in chalk on the wall of the house. Mm-hmm. So if you're ever in an abandoned house in western Pennsylvania and you see a date written in chalk, Ron's been there. And one of the houses in the film, you see, you know, I, I just he writes down the date while we're there, and then you pan over to the wall, and there are probably 20 more dates written on the wall dating back 10 years. Mm-hmm. So he'll repeatedly go to the same places. He knows what's in each place. He knows what he needs to get. And, you know, when I was filming with him, I had a SUV, so... He took full advantage of that whenever he took me somewhere. <laughs> we would always bring back a load of lumber or uh, doors or something else. But you've got this great, so, yeah. funny shot of him 
you know, he, it's a, a moving shot on the road, and all of a sudden his bike sort of comes into the road, and he's got all this stuff piled wide on the back of this little bike. Yeah, it's, he has so just about anything. His rule is anything up to a cast iron bathtub, and he has carried a cast iron bathtub on the back of his bike uh, <laughs> that weighs, you know, three, two, three hundred pounds. So, so he's famously driven around Butler with toilets. Um, on the back, and it's not like this is a giant Harley motorcycle. It's like a hundred cc uh, Honda scooter type bike. I forget what kind of bike he has. I think it's a Honda. It's a small bike, uh-huh. uh, regardless. And it should not be. You know, you think that stuff would uh, just make the front wheel pop up, and you can get anywhere. But he is a master of balance and physics, and somehow mm-hmm. figures out how to do it. Yes, yeah, so it's very, it's so. a very whimsical portrait that we get at the very beginning of this. And then it starts... Very much so. And, you know, he's also... You hear someone like this, and it sounds like he's a recluse and, you know, would be an introvert, but he's a, he's a very social person and funny and has a great sense of humor. Mm-hmm. Um, and you, you know, it's it's not just... It's more than a just a spooky look inside this big structure. You know, he has fun, and he loves people going through his stuff and looking at all the things he's collected and built and found, and he has, uh, you know... He's a fun person to be around. Yeah, he he gives people tours of this because it's come become kind of a, a tourist destination in a way. Yeah, almost uh, 400 people per year, and he has everyone sign in when they get there, uh, put their date down, and also their age. So if you're not comfortable revealing your age, you can't go to Ron's house because <laughs> you have to write it down on the sign in sheet. Oh, he'll refuse you if you, if you don't put the age down. He'll do, yeah, he'll hand the uh, he'll hand it back to you and tell you to write your write your age down. It doesn't take long before we start to see sort of tiny cracks in that that whimsy, and then there we start yeah. to it. We sort of pull out a little bit, and we start to see his family. Uh, we start to see that maybe he's a, a a little mischievous in how he deals with his family and what he tells them. Yeah, that, and that was something getting into you know it, it was kind of the way I experienced Ron as well. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I was initially drawn in just personally before I even made the film by everything he built, the tales he told, how he uh, gathered all his stuff, and then it wasn't until I got deeper into the project that I started to learn about his previous family life. First, learning of his own history as a, as a child, and you know how he was. A normal kid, and then suddenly, when he was about two years old, he just stopped talking, stopped engaging with his family. They didn't know what to do with him, and his uh, mom took him to a bunch of doctors. They wouldn't give her any answers. This is in the 1950s, until they realized he loved building things and um, just provided him the tools to do that. And what that allowed him to do was sort of come out of his shell and start talking again, start engaging with people was actually able to go to school and um, was always in a special ed program, but still uh, was able to do that. I don't think high school or going to school was a very good experience for him. Mm. Uh, You know, I don't think the kids that he went to school with didn't understand why Ron was different. You know, his own family didn't even understand why Ron was different. They just labeled him as mentally challenged, and that led to him getting teased a lot. But his own family, not knowing exactly what was wrong with him, his parents couldn't articulate why he was different to the kids, so they just saw someone who got, uh, in a lot of ways, just got preferential treatment from Mm -hmm. their parents. He was the oldest of all the kids. Two other kids? Two his younger siblings, you know, would often play tricks on him or uh, do things and blame them for it. And he would, Ron would always get the benefit of the doubt because he was, he was different. Yeah, and it was, there were two siblings, right? A brother and a sister? He, yeah, he actually, he's one of five kids. He's got two twin brothers. Uh, one of the twin brothers didn't want to be in the project. Okay. And he's got, I'm sorry, six kids. He has five siblings. He has three sisters and two brothers. Uh, one of the sisters participated, and, and then one of the twins did as well. And that's who you see in the in the documentary. So then we, we pull out even further. Well, before we get to the, the more broad stories, uh, you don't mention autism until later in the film. Yeah. So what was the uh, what was the idea 
there? Why did why did you wait until later in the story to to sort of mention that as a possibility for Ron? I didn't see it as the driving theme of the movie. I wanted this to be about Ron, you know, a story about a guy in Pennsylvania that's different and has done some amazing things and uh, how that impacted his community, his family, and what lies ahead for him. Because autism obviously is a much talked about topic, especially in the last 10 years. Mm -hmm. And I didn't want to land on either side of that. I didn't want to make this film about autism because it really, you know, uh, there are, there is some mention, there's obviously a mention of autism in the film, but other projects I've seen about autism will often cause some controversy. And I just, I wanted to stay away from all that. And I wanted to leave a lot of conclusions up to the viewer. I didn't want to paint a, mm. a picture saying like, he should have had earlier intervention and the family wouldn't be dealing with this or, you know, you should, you, they should just stay out of it and let him be. I just want, I wanted to tell the story as it was and do that in a, a respectful, respectful way. I think I could have easily painted it in a, what I saw, but what I saw changed throughout the film, mm -hmm. you know, I, things I thought at the beginning of the process and things I thought at the end of the process and even now reflecting, I, I feel differently about some things that I did when I, even when I was still editing. So yeah, basically I don't like, I don't personally, I don't like it when filmmakers editorialize mm -hmm. too much on their, so I wanted to keep the story as pure as possible. Obviously we're editing, you know, three years of, of uh, timeline, mm -hmm. but I wanted to stay as true to the real story as I did. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, the family seen the film and they were all very complimentary and felt that it did represent them and what they've been through and what Ron's going through now in a, in a very accurate life. Mm -hmm. So I was happy about that. And you, you've presented him in a way that, that autism is an aspect of who he is, not, a, not the defining characteristic of who he is. Correct. And I think that's something or a discussion that I wanted to come out of this movie is that is autism a disease that needs to be cured or is it a new way of being, mm -hmm. you know, is it just a different personality type or uh, maybe that's not the best way to put it. I'm not an expert. I just want to say that I'm not uh -huh. a doctor. <laughs> I'm not an autism expert, but you know, I, I think the discussions are out there and he's a unique case where you could look at him and say, well, if Ron had been given early behavioral therapy, maybe some of this doesn't happen. Maybe he's successful in other parts of his life, you know, going to school, having a job, and living living and caring on his own. But the other side of that is you don't get this giant structure and you don't get this eccentric, mm -hmm. um, unique life that he's been able to lead on the other side of it. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, with that side of things, there is the bad part, which is kind of what we, we find out later in the movie, that because he wasn't given these, this earlier intervention therapy, he's not great at taking care of himself. He's, he doesn't have a consistent job. Mm -hmm. And now, um, you know, he's kind of facing uh, a bad situation when his, his mom eventually has to um, leave the house. And, mm -hmm. you know, he can't really survive on his own then. Well, here, this is part of, of what I thought was so brilliant about the movie. It, it It's a sort of nesting doll of a movie where you start out with a very, very specific story. And then it broadens uh, to a, a lot of uh, all these different, more universal aspects of it. First, you've got the the family trying to figure out what to do with, with one family member when they can't take care of themselves. That's a, a very... I think that that's uh, a very common thing that, that a lot of people probably deal with. Uh, you've got this portrait of a lost generation of people who are on the spectrum for autism before it was more widely known or identified. So there's, there's, there's a sort of generation of, of people out there who never got any help. But then you've also got this wider story about... The economic depression. Well, why does Ron 
why has Ron been able to build this giant structure from uh, the stuff he's gotten from abandoned homes? Because there are so many abandoned homes. So you get to so many things that, that are so much wider than just Ron's story through this very, very specific story. That's what, well, as you list all those things, I'm like, did, is there too much in the movie? Is it about too, <laughs> many, <laughs> is it about too many things? Did I try to touch on too much stuff? been more focused but i think what goes originally when i was drawn to ron i i saw him and i met him and uh, i was i saw him as like a 15 to 20 minute story and then it wasn't until uh, his father passed and his mom was living alone with him at nine you know 89 years old that it became a feature blank story because mm. at that and at that point i just saw okay ron is uh you know he's leading up to this very crucial point in his life when everything that he's known for 50, 55 years is about to change. Mm -hmm. um, and it's more than just watching a, a guy who's created some crazy structure in the middle of Pennsylvania um, and how he's done it. Uh, you know, a, a, a short thing about how he's built all this stuff and what's inside. Uh, but then as I got into that, um, I found more and more and more that just couldn't be ignored. So you, uh, someone told me once, you, you set out to make one movie, you shoot a different movie, and then you edit a, the, the final movie, what mm -hmm. it's actually going to be. And that's definitely the way that I um, came into this. But were you surprised I, when you finished the film how much was in there? Yes, a little bit. And I, I was hesitant about putting too much about one thing or another but I, I think I we found a way to kind of to make everything work with the edit and feel natural because that was another tough thing with the edit was with all these topics you, you don't want to feel like you're just sandwiching something in mm -hmm. you, you want it to all flow you know like obviously it's not a single moment in time but you should feel like you're effortlessly moving from one topic to the next so mm -hmm. that was uh, that you know it Definitely was work to get it all in there, but I think it turned out okay. And your main job until this point has been directing uh, television, correct? And you met uh, Ron on American Pickers. That's right. So the first season of American Pickers, no one knew who the Pickers were, uh, and the casting team would just place ads in local papers or make calls, find people with collections that they could go take a look at. A lot of the places we went, the people weren't actually interested in selling anything. We just needed to get in places to... The, the backbone of that show was telling history through items, you know, similar uh -huh. to other shows in History Channel. You just had to find a vessel to um, get some history. So uh, we placed an ad in the Penny Saver in uh, Pittsburgh, and he, uh, his cousin John reached out and said, you've got to come check this guy out. You've never seen anything like this before. Mm -hmm. So I, that was 2009, 2008 or 2009 that mm -hmm. that happened. Um, and we, at that point, were just going from city to city. It was like I uh, likened it to being in a band because we'd stay one night in a hotel and then it was like a three, four hour drive to the next city, uh -huh. stay that night in the hotel and then get up and go to another location. So the night before I would always look up the person to see if they had any web presence just to see, get, get a little bit of research because we had nothing uh, most of the time on what we were about to get into. And I, I looked up Ron and John, who's his cousin slash friend that's in the film, mm -hmm. um, had posted some videos going to Ron's house. And I was like, I found those on YouTube and was immediately um, blown away. Well, for that show, it must have been yeah. like a holy grail for that particular show. Oh, for sure. I, I came down the next morning and showed with my computer, and I was like, this is this is the real deal. Talking to Mike and Frank, I was like, you got to uh -huh. check this out. This guy is, this is incredible what we're about to go see. Um, so we went to the episode... Um, they were pretty blown away by it. And, uh, of course, Ron started talking about Piney. 
the mic and uh-huh. like telling him about the Duesenberg and all the cars that were up there. So we actually stayed an additional day um, hoping, and you know, we used our research team to try and find out who had the rights to the property. Piney Mansion is, is a place where Ron says so there's a 50 room mansion somewhere out in the woods. Um, it's in the movie. Uh, or the search for it's in the movie. Whether mm. or not we find it, I guess you have to go watch the movie. Hmm. Well, but, he he's, uh, uh, he he's, he has items from this place, or says he has items that he's brought back he has, that are yeah, pretty he fancy. He has items from this place in his house. Was showing this to the guy, so we actually hung out on that shoot for an extra day to see if we could get up this place. Well, we couldn't track down the property owner. If we're going to go film somewhere, we have to know who owns the property. So I. Based on everything Ron had told me, seeing him, just knowing that this is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity for a filmmaker, someone like myself, uh, <clears throat> to get a story that is that unique, that amazing, and that hasn't been covered. And, you know, I'm always fasc- I'm fascinated by things that are untouched by outside influence. Mm. And people that are not impacted by our greater culture and you know you see at one point in the movie I'm asking Ron about some pretty basic stuff that everyone in the culture would know Uh know, who is Michael Jordan who is Steven Spielberg who is Harrison Ford he has no clue about any of that stuff he lives in his own world and that's just incredibly fascinating to me when you were doing that I was wondering why you didn't ask him about any uh, local sports people because he's he's wearing a Steelers jersey uh every so often <laughs> yeah. I'm wondering would he Look, know he, does, he doesn't know who, who Ben Roethlisberger is he doesn't he doesn't know who Terry Bradshaw is he didn't, uh-huh. I, I I didn't get that far um it was just a kind of quick in the moment thing uh-huh and uh I, what brought it on was talking about Bonnie and Clyde and then one of his friends had re- referred to him as the Indiana Jones of Butler County. Uh-huh. <laughs> so I that's that's kind of where the Indiana Jones and Steven Spielberg and Harrison Ford thing came up, and then it just led me to I was like I'm, I'm you know just going to take this a little bit further. So that is to go back to uh, what I was talking about before. That is what um, drew me into Ron, drew me into Ron's orbit drew me into his story so I, I came out a couple months later visited him um, did a little bit of filming I think I made two visits over that year and then just kept in contact with him by phone mm-hmm. uh, he would call me every couple months and touch base and I think I may have made one or two trips out there um, and then uh, heard about his his dad and um, at that point, got a little bit more involved with the story. Mm-hmm. And the, the situation with his dad was, just for people who haven't seen the... Uh... Sure. His dad uh, passed away, and it's been six years ago now. Mm-hmm. And Ron had always lived with his mom and dad his entire life. And um, with the loss of his dad, what became much more real was that they were going to have to deal with the structure Ron's future you know Ron's 67 years old now but he is extremely healthy Mm -hmm. he's healthier than a lot of 35 year olds he's go and you know both his parents lived um, his mom is 92 now and his dad lived until he was 90 so he's got the, (laughs) the right genetics keep going for a long time and uh, at this point in time at that point in time there is no plan for Ron his parents never sat down and, and you know figured out okay when we go how how is this property going to be handled mm-hmm. what's going to happen with his structure who's going to care for him he's, he's very uh, capable in a lot of ways but and a lot of others, he, uh, his autism just doesn't allow him to grasp the full picture uh, uh, of, of what's happening. It's one mm-hmm. thing I learned throughout making the film is autism, one of the core features of it is a very concrete 
thinking. You know, mm-hmm. he's con- he knows what's happening today. He's very much in the moment. <clears throat> and thinking abstract about what's going to happen in five years or what's going to happen ten years from now, a five-year, ten-year plan that it doesn't, um, doesn't really sink in with him because as far as he's concerned, the way things are today is the way things will, will always be. And there's no reason any of that would change. That was an interesting so. part of this as well. When the, the psychologists came in to evaluate him, it was psychologists, right? Am I do I do I have the right? Uh, yeah, it wasn't That's social right. workers. Well, they came and they gave him a very specific test where they sat down with his picture book and they asked him to fill in blanks in a storyline. And they de- they determine at one point they say they don't think he has he he really has an imagination because he continually denies the more fantastical elements there there are flying frogs i think i can't remember what the other ones were he just sort of said he looked at the pictures and said well first of all frogs don't fly so i don't know why you're asking me about that but yeah. you you contrast that almost immediately when you show something he built out of these bright lights that uh, that was oddly conceptual that he called a tree was that it? Was that contrast intentional? Did you want to show that Ron does have an imagination after all? Well, I think that's uh, one of the, yeah, I did. The and if you just look at what he's done, like how could you not? And what is you know? And that leads to a bigger conversation. What is creativity? Is it being able to manufacture a make-believe story, mm-hmm. or is it something? That and I, you know, in my interview with the psychologist, which part that part wasn't in the film, but I got into a conversation with her about like, what, well, what, you know, is a uh, painter or any a sculptor like when they're making art, are they thinking about an abstract story or is it something that just comes out of them? Mm-hmm. You know, when Beethoven sat down to compose music, I'm pretty sure it just manifested itself that, that was just what he was driven to do mm-hmm. and this whole structure is what Ron's driven to do so what you know you can't put, you can't really put a label on creativity like that that that's um, yet another nest in this story and I it just struck me when you mentioned Indiana Jones and Piney Piney being the mansion that he wants to find the, yeah. that might help them sort of solve a few problems it that last twenty minutes of the film, maybe it's maybe it's a little less than that, sort of almost turns into a like an action thriller when you're looking for Piney. Yeah, it's yeah. like Stand By. Yeah, it was Stand By Me. This is kind of what I thought of when when all that was happening uh, when they're looking for that that body in the woods. Um, it's a bunch of grown men out, you know, searching for uh, a pot of gold. Mm. Um, and it's it's exciting. I, You know, I've been out to that plot of land probably ten times. Mm-hmm. And every single time, I'm, I'm, I'm sure that, that we're going to come up on it. And we may have. Mm. Just got to watch the movie. I, I wanted to... Uh ask about the humor in the the film as well to go back a little bit there's a lot of humor in here and it it pretty much comes directly from ron and how much did you worry about capturing that without it looking exploitive in any way we you know it is something that i did think about and ron thankfully is a funny person Mm -hmm. uh so that helped out quite a bit and i love comedy you know i think that that is actually my first love as far as television movies is comedy and that shaped a lot of my um sort of perspective on television and filmmaking and uh i don't think there's anything i'll ever make that doesn't have a few laughs in it um and especially with this story because it does have some very heavy elements it just you know makes it a lot easier to watch when you can laugh occasionally. You don't want it mm-hmm. to be a total bummer. Uh, but as far as not making fun of Ron, it was, I, I did keep an eye on it, but because he's funny, it was actually pretty easy. Mm-hmm. You just don't make, you know, you don't want to put some 
goofy music in or right you know just just be uh don't be thoughtful or if i was not thoughtful about the way i portrayed him it would have been much easier but mm-hmm. i genuinely like ron and i think that my goal was to get our relationship to come to kind of come across or the way that i saw him and the way i experienced him to come across that camera and um as long as i had that in mind i don't laugh at him so i i wasn't too worried about the audience doing it either. <clears throat> now, how how has the reaction been? What have what have people gotten out of this film when you've shown it so far at the the festival circuit? Basically, now, right? Yeah. So the it, it's been very good. I'm always a skeptic, <laughs> a skeptic, and I I want to hear the the bad stuff that people have to say because I want it to be the best it can be. So. Mm-hmm. I always listen to, to negative feedback and, you know, take the good with the bad and try to implement some of that if I can. But that being said, there hasn't been, it, it's, it's been well received everywhere. Mm-hmm. Um, I think people at festivals are primed to see movies and are primed to like your documentary. And uh, of course, when they're in front of you, they're always complimentary. So I've, I've sought out some bad stuff but haven't really seen it yet we'll see when it gets a wider release how it's received the good stuff has been uh a lot of people like you said if you don't have someone with autism a lot of people have someone that in their family that they have to have a long-term care plan for Mm -hmm. uh so that has resonated with a lot of people or families with kids with uh disabilities either from a sibling perspective or from a parental perspective, a lot of time the parents don't realize how it affects the other siblings Mm -hmm. or other siblings feeling justified. You know, Tim was very honest about his feelings. His brother was very honest about his feelings growing up. And I think that's something at least I would feel that those are feelings. If I had those as a child, I would feel guilty about talking about that stuff as an adult. Mm -hmm. Um, Just because you know how it can be perceived, but kids don't, you know, when they see their brother or sister getting special treatment, they don't know any different. Uh-huh. They they just want what they want, and these kids were kind of selfish, and that's okay. That's the way you should be as a child. So that uh, a, a lot of that has, has come out of it. And the uh, people are fascinated with Piney Mansion and just the excitement of the journey. Um, and as well as uh, I've met some people from the lost generation, this generation of people that had autism uh, as a child, you know, in the 50s and 60s, 70s, and were never diagnosed. Mm -hmm. And to have people bring, or this story sort of brings some uh, light to that, uh, to that part of the population. Because right now, all the autism focuses on children and therapy for kids. And uh, that's, there's a whole group of people out there that is, that are living in group homes that mm. um, have a lot of times still not been diagnosed with autism. They were just labeled as mentally handicapped, and autism is is a social disorder. It affects how you interact with other people. Obviously, it affects how you perceive situations, the future. You know, not being able to do all these things. But the other part of that is. A lot of times, autism is coupled with is coupled with mental retardation. Uh, people with low IQs, but some people with autism don't have low IQs, so they're kind of trapped. Um, they may not be verbal, or they may barely be verbal, or have odd ways of communicating, but have a normal IQ, and they're sort of uh, uh, trapped in a, in a group home um, setting and are you know frustrated for their entire lives just because they no one's recognized what's wrong with them and they haven't been able to uh, express themselves mm-hmm. so and that's been um those are kind of the three main groups that that have come out of it and um uh you know it's a fun ride at the end looking for piney mansion as mm-hmm. well you could have made so many different films from this. How did you how did you end up with, with this one? Uh, you know, I'm saying you had all these different elements. You could have done... This could have been dozens of, uh, of different films. 
it, depending on the choices you would make, which which what do you wanted to follow, what you wanted to focus on? Yeah, I second guess myself all the time about you know going this way or that way. But I think this was of all the the pieces that were there, this was the best possible film to make from that. It's this was the first thing you know I've done a lot of TV, and that's always for someone else. Mm-hmm. It's you know, for a network, uh, for this place or that place. But this is the first thing that was done with, um, you know, a feature-length thing that was, it's wrong, but it's also my perspective. And I think as a mm-hmm. filmmaker, you want to, above all else, show people your perspective and make the film for you that... Uh, other people will hopefully enjoy because if you try to make it for someone else, if I try to make it for his family, if I try to make it for autism advocates, it's it's not going to be the best film it could be. Mm-hmm. So this is, these are the best parts of, of Ron's story and the way I saw Ron and the way I saw the situation from the most objective standpoint I could put forward, um, including humor, et cetera. So yeah, that's, I guess the answer is I chose to make this film because it's the film that I wanted to make. Mm -hmm. It's the way that I saw the story. Do you keep in touch with Ron and his family? Yeah, I do. Um, Ron is still uh, doing well. Um, Even since the, uh, the screening in Salem, though, I found out that his mom has some early onset dementia Mm -hmm. and now they're having they just started having a caretaker go to the house um twice a week to kind of keep up and make sure everything's okay when the family because her family obviously they all have their own lives they can't be there Mm -hmm. two times a week every every time so um that's that's happening and it's kind of starting you know the the final chapter of, uh, or the next chapter of, of what's going to happen with Ron and they're facing some, uh, tough decisions coming up. Is, is the film done then? Would you go back if things change? I haven't ruled that out. I mean, we're in, uh, in talks for, war um, distribution right now. There's distribution lined up that, final deal hasn't been signed but uh the way i look at it is ron in order to get the best support or some sort of you know i would love a call to action at the end of the film basically if someone sees this and feels the feels driven to support ron that they could help in some way because Mm -hmm. the family needs that financial help they just don't have the money if, to keep him in um, his current living situation. Mm-hmm. You know, there are a lot of things that have to happen before that, and you know that's the, the kind of the driving narrative of the film. Mm-hmm. So, if the best way to get that um, to get people to take that action is to um, continue the film longer, continue the story, continue following it uh then then um that's what i'm gonna do this, nothing's been ruled out yet I, this, I don't know exactly what's gonna happen but that that definitely is on the table and this this was your uh or is your first feature length film correct correct what's the best you can hope for in making a, a documentary film it seems like somewhat of a, a thankless task I think the best thing you can hope for is that people see it, mm-hmm. that it, it reaches a wide audience. Mm-hmm. And working in a project like this where there's a, a great person, great subjects involved that you can potentially help makes it uh, a lot easier to, to get through the process. I'm not going to say it makes it easy because mm-hmm. it was difficult at a lot of points. And... I doubted whether the project was ever going to get finished several times. Mm-hmm. Um, but, you know, every
everybody would like to see some fun. You know, it'd be great if we got financial gain from the actual sale of the rights to the film uh-huh. and we're able to give some of that to Ron and his family. Uh, but with the current landscape and all these films out there, I, I don't I don't think that's going to uh, be the case. Hmm. Well, why did you choose documentary specifically uh, as something you wanted to pursue? I think this particular story chose me a little bit. Uh-huh. Uh, it was just after meeting Ron, it was I, it was kind of something that I felt like I I had to do. Um, mm-hmm. Documentary is a genre. Um, I like I alluded to before. I've always just been drawn to things that are totally unique and untouched by outside influence. So when I found one of those stories, when I found Ron, um, it was exactly that. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to tell that story and bring it to a larger audience. Um, I think narrative, documentary, any sort of filmmaking just comes from a, a desire to be a storyteller and I've always kind of had that I've always had that bug mm. um, since I was a kid one way or another uh, you know in in college I did some stand-up comedy and then out of that just kind of landed went, went and lived in New York and saw filmmaking and television as, as, a, as a way to be creative and, and keep telling stories and find my way into doing documentary television mm-hmm. and learn those tools and those skills and um, just use the resources that I had at hand, which were skills in documentary, a, a great story in front of me, um, and, and told it the best way that I could. What's it, you, uh, you took the reverse Bob Saget route. Bob Saget started out making documentaries in, in college, and then it took him to stand-up. How did you go from... Stand-up's a particular interest of mine. How did you go from, from that to documentary making? Well, uh, you know, I grew up watching a ton of stand-up, and mm-hmm. that was kind of my dream. Uh, and I did it, but also was getting paid a ton of money for it and was just you know I was living in Nebraska at the time yeah. where I went to college at the University of Nebraska in Lincoln and they had a couple open mics um, and a couple stand up shows that I got on but didn't you know didn't pursue it much farther than that uh-huh. uh, because I felt like I needed to do something that was a little more in line with my college degree and had an opportunity to move to New York and got a job as a production assistant mm-hmm. on a cooking show so that kind of became my life <clears throat> um, and just gradually moved up from there and sort of learned on the job. I went to school for journalism, not television, uh, and picked up a lot of skills doing unscripted TV. And um, I've always been someone, like I said, that has just, whatever opportunities in front of me, I'm not going to say no to it because I'm waiting for something else. Mm-hmm. So... I uh, took advantage of that, and it led me down this path. And I've enjoyed the process, you know. I think that uh, I'm always, I've am always i always been someone that would just rather get out there and shoot something than spend days and days and uh, months and, and years pining over writing the perfect script or doing this or that. Mm. I'd rather just get my hands on it and start making. So documentary lends itself well to that. And, mm. and the... I love the discovery uh, that happened a lot on this project, like I said, with not knowing what was going on within the family, not knowing all the stuff about autism. You know, I'm the way you kind of did the interview was, and the way the movie is structured is the same way that I discovered the story. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, I, I, you know, part of that movie structure is bringing my own experience to the audience. And your comic instincts are there. They show up. Whatever you, whatever your experience was with with stand up, however long you did it, I, I think you can see in in some parts of the movie uh, your comic instincts. Yeah, the 
I didn't, and the comedy didn't stop with stand up. You know, I did a lot of comedic shorts as well as working in television. You know, even the more serious programs, you always try to work some sort of humor in there, or you see a situation and you think, oh, this is, uh, you know, when you put this element, this element, and this element together, it becomes funny. Mm-hmm. There's that scene in there where they're looking at that spot on the wall. Yes. And, you know, while that's happening, I'm, it was, it was, <laughs> it's just, that's one of the few moments where you kind of uh, laughing at them for lack of, you know, I think you are laughing at them. You're laughing at the situation. Uh-huh. It's very sort of Grey Gardens, odd couple-esque. And while that was happening, I was laughing on the inside, mm-hmm. but also knew you know, what sort of coverage I needed to get to make this a comedic moment. Mm. Um, and just so people so. know the context, it's it's a, a Ron and his, his mother are looking at a, a, a square on the wall that has seems to have magically appeared since the, the yeah. evening before. Yeah, when yeah. you explain it, it sounds pretty unfunny, but... Yes, well, I don't want to give it away. I don't want to give it... By this. And it gives you a window into what their life is actually like. Uh-huh. That's what I was excited about. Is that was a couple of years into filming with them, and they completely forgot that I was around. Uh-huh. You know? So uh-huh. that, and that's that's them. You know, day to day, that is their. That's how they communicate. That's how they solve problems. Um, and uh, that's a hundred percent real. Would you... I was just lucky to be there to, to capture that moment. It's a great intro to uh, their day-to-day life. Would you ever try stand-up again? Uh, I, I've thought about it, but I have not, uh, I've not gone up. Uh-huh. It's a lot of work. Especially, you know, you're not going to, like, go, I have a lot of friends that do stand-up and know enough that you're not going to go up there, uh, and just be a smash hit your first week, you know. Right. It's years. I think there's some Seinfeld, uh, maybe it's a documentary where he talks about how your stand-up, you have your stand-up age. Uh-huh. You know, you're you're an infant, basically, for a couple of years, and you have to keep all comics here that, you, you know, it's a muscle you have to work. It's like working out. You have to keep going up or you're going to be bad. Right. Yeah. How good your material is. You have to keep going up over and over and over again. Right, yeah. At this point in my life, I don't know that I have the time or desire to dedicate that much energy to something. Right. Uh, you know, I think Judd Apatow had a, was at a point in his career where he could do that, and he went went back, and his special was pretty good, but uh, I'm not at that level of success yet. Uh, well, what, what do you want to do next? Uh... I would love to find another um, another story that I'm as excited about. Um, I don't. I have been working on a few things. I don't think I've found anything yet. Mm-hmm. I have uh, subjects that grab my interest, but nothing's really captivated me the way that uh, that Ron did. Mm-hmm. And what's next for the film? Where can people find more about it? So. This, it just played last night at the Florida Film Festival. Um, it's screening the uh, again the 13th in Orlando, and then the following weekend. Let me pull up my calendar here. It's uh, it's in Minneapolis, the Minneapolis International Film Festival, the 21st and 22nd of April, um, and then again on the 25th. Mm-hmm. In the uh, first week of May, it's in San Francisco at the SF Doc Fest. And waiting to hear about a couple more dates um, in June. It might be in Seattle. But nothing's confirmed yet. So there's, there's a few screenings coming up over the next few weeks. Oh, and also April 30th, it's at the, uh, it's called the Port, Jeff- Port Jefferson Documentary Series on Long Island. Mm-hmm. Um, and there's a Facebook page, facebook.com slash moleman documentary. I'm unfortunately that's the main hub of information for Mole Man, even though everyone suddenly hates Facebook even more than they did before. Uh-huh. <laughs> uh, right. So don't delete your account just yet. Just wait until Mole Man gets the official release, and then you can 
kick Mark Zuckerberg, Zuckerberg out of your life forever. And you, you say that there's possible distribution you're talking yeah. about now. You're not necessarily ready to, to mention that. Yeah, I can't uh, mention it. The deal isn't done yet, but it, it's uh, curated. It's going to be barring any major disaster. It'll be on a streaming service, uh, and we'll get a worldwide release. Should be later this year. Mm-hmm. And, and people can look at the uh, the Facebook account for that announcement. Yeah, the Facebook page. We'll have those updates on it. Well, thanks for taking the, the time to speak with me today. I appreciate it. Uh, uh, I really loved the, the documentary. I loved how much it got into, and I, I'm, I really uh, hope people can get to see it soon. Absolutely. Thanks for uh, taking the time to talk to me. I, uh, I, I appreciate the interest and um, always love chatting about the film and uh, talking about Ron. Mm-hmm. So uh, it's great. An arrow to the head isn't always a trick. Thanks again to Guy Fiorita for the conversation. His film is called Mole Man. Watch for it on the festival circuit. It's playing in Stony Brook, New York at the end of April, and hopefully the distribution deal will come through shortly so you can see it on your own home movie devices. You can find out more on Facebook under Mole Man Documentary and more about Fiorita at shoutchorus.com. And a reminder, if you enjoyed this episode or other episodes, please consider subscribing and spreading the word by rating and reviewing the podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, and your other podcast distribution sources. You can also see galleries and trailers and clips on the blog at www.departmentoftangents.com. Next week's guest is author Daniel Krauss, who wrote the book The Shape of Water. This is not a typical tie-in or novelization of a movie. Krauss had the original idea that sparked Guillermo del Toro to write the screenplay for the Oscar-winning film. It was something he thought he'd get around to writing eventually, the story of a creature and a human who fall in love in a lab, inspired by the universal horror movie Creature from the Black Lagoon. He got to flesh out the characters in the book, and one of the backstories he tells is about how the heavy, Strickland, plucks the creature from his home in the Amazon, and how that experience changes him. You can get a feel for that from this chapter. Strickland is already on the boat, the Josefina, talking with the captain, Enriquez. This is chapter 5 of part 1, The Shape of Water, as read by Jenna Lamia. Chapter 5 Within the hour they depart. Delight, say the guides, is the dry season. It is called Viral. Tragedy is the wet season. No one will even tell Strickland what it's called. The legacy of the previous wet season are furos, flooded shortcuts across the river's bends. And Josefina takes them while she can. These oxbow switchbacks transform the Amazon into an animal. It dashes. It hides. It pounces. Enriquez hoots with joy and throttles the engine, and the green, peaty jungle fills with toxic black smoke. Strickland grips the rail, gazes into the water. It is milk chocolate brown with marshmallow froth. Fifteen-foot elephant grass bristles along the banks like the back of a colossal, wakening bear. Enriquez likes to hand the controls to the first mate so he can take notes in his logbook. He boasts that he writes for publication and fame. Everyone will know the name of the great explorer, Raul Romo Zavala Enriquez. He caresses the logbook's leather, likely dreaming of an author photo of appropriate smugness. Strickland smothers his hate, disgust, and fear. All three get in the way. All three give you away. Hoyt taught him that in Korea. Just do your job. The most advantageous feeling is to feel nothing at all. Monotony, though, might be the jungle's stealthiest killer. Day after day, Josefina traces an endless ribbon of water beneath expanding spirals of mist. One day, Strickland glances upward to find a large black bird like a greasy smear across the blue sky. A vulture. Now that he's noticed it, he finds it every day, making lazy loops, anticipating his demise. Strickland is well-armed, a Stoner M63 assault rifle in the hold and a Model 70 Beretta in his holster. 
and he itches to shoot the bird down. The bird is Hoyt, watching. The bird is Laney, saying goodbye. He doesn't know which. Sailing is treacherous at night, so the boat anchors. Usually Strickland chooses to stand alone at the bow, let the crew whisper, let the Indios Bravos stare like he's some kind of American monster. The moon this particular evening is a great hole carved through night flesh to reveal pale, luminescent bone, and he does not notice Enriquez creep up on him. Do you see? The frolicking pink? Strickland is furious, not at the captain, but himself. What sort of soldier leaves his back exposed? Plus, he's caught gazing at the moon. It's feminine, something Laney would do while asking him to hold her hand. He shrugs, hoping Enriquez will go away. Instead, the captain gestures with his logbook. Strickland looks into the distance and sees a sinuous leap and silver spray. Boto, Enriquez says. River dolphin. What do you think? Two meters, two and a half? Only the males are so pink. We are lucky to see one. Very solitary, the male boto. Keeps to himself. Strickland wonders if Enriquez is playing games, mocking his offish proclivities. The captain takes off his straw hat, and his white hair glows in the moonlight. Do you know the legend of the boto? I suppose not. They teach you more about guns and bullets, eh? Many of the indigenous believe the pink river dolphin is an encantado, a shapeshifter. On nights like this, he transforms himself into a man of irresistible good looks and walks to the nearest village. You can tell him by the hat he wears to hide his blowhole. In this disguise, he seduces the village's most beautiful women and leads them back to his home beneath the river. Wait and see. We will find very few women along the river at night, so afraid are they of encantado kidnap. But I think it is a hopeful story. It's not some underwater paradise preferable to a life of poverty and incest and violence? It's coming closer. Strickland didn't mean to say it aloud. Ah, then we should definitely rejoin the others. They say looking into the eyes of an encantado curses you with nightmares until you are driven insane. Enriquez pats Strickland on the back like the friend he isn't and ambles away, whistling. Strickland kneels beside the rail. The dolphin dives like a knitting needle. It probably knows what boats are. It probably wants fish scraps. Strickland unholsters the Beretta and takes aim where he estimates the dolphin will emerge. Fanciful fables don't deserve to live. Harsh reality, that's what Hoyt seeks and what Strickland must find if he hopes to get out of here alive. The dolphin's shape becomes visible beneath the water. Strickland waits. He wants to look it in the eyes. He'll be the one to deliver nightmares. He'll be the one to drive the jungle insane. Dear Young, 